Reincarnation. The idea that we return to another body after the death of our current body has fascinated humanity since the beginning of time. It raises arresting questions. What is life? What is consciousness? Is there a biological base of consciousness? It's the kind of question that we cannot address from a scientific point of view. Is birth really the beginning? It's one of the more difficult questions from, from either from a scientific or a philosophical standpoint. Is death truly the end? Presumably everyone has had past lives. New discoveries from the frontiers of consciousness studies. You cannot reduce mind consciousness to brain activity. Near-death experiences. Consciousness separates from the body and goes over the body. And past life memories research. There is some entity that carries on are shedding new light on the way we look at life science today is witnessing a paradigm shift the paradigm shift is going to affect us in a major major way new alternative explanations are emerging science is really good at experiments and theory development and marry that with the mystical experience will develop a whole new civilization could it be that now finally we are closer to understanding the timeless mysteries of life, death, and reincarnation. I am. I, am. I exist. I am aware of my existence. I am aware of the world around me. But who is that I? The very fact that I experience myself as I, that's consciousness. What is consciousness? I don't know what that is. I know I have it, but it's hard to explain. What makes me conscious is that I have this distinct feeling that I am separate from you, the objects of my experience. Are we humans nothing more than machines? The machine, they are totally devoid of subjective experiences. Consciousness is using the brain in order for us to experience the world in the way that we do as, as humans. Could our essential identity be beyond the body? Consciousness may need to go outside the box in order to be able to perceive it in its wholeness. The source of consciousness is all that is, which is the source of everything that exists in the universe. Consciousness is the ground of all being. Birth and death. Two of humanity's greatest mysteries. Of the two, birth we like to consider as hopeful. A beginning with infinite possibilities. A miracle even, from a scientific point of view. A single chosen cell divides and subdivides a mere 50 times. And a new person is produced. How does a dormant cell made of protein and water, know how to shape itself precisely into hands, eyes, skin and brain. A journey that starts with a single cell reaches its pinnacle where a trillion of them work in perfect synchronization. A million brain cells appear every minute and the newborn is ready to emerge. Not a moment sooner, or not a moment later. Just when the time is right. It's a split-second action. A small nudge, and life takes a giant leap. A single cell, now morphed into a fully grown body, that will pump 700 million litres of blood during its lifetime, and blow 672 million breaths. A perfect machine, What's more, given time, it is fully capable of producing another perfect machine. Yes, life is a miracle, all right. The other mystery we don't like to think too much about. It leaves us hopeless. An end to the glorious beginning 
that tragically turns the once infinite possibilities to hopelessly finite impossibilities. Death lacks the charm and promise of birth. There is no miraculous coordination of a million cells here. Just a thread heartbeat that crosses an invisible line and becomes still. The perfect machine that once fired a million neurons a minute now refuses to fire up a single neuron. One tiny drop of blood seems impossible to pump. The body that was once warm turns cold. What goes wrong? Typically, 99% of our cells are still functional. Three billion codons. The individual letters in the book of human DNA remain intact. Most cells don't even get the news for some time. If the body is revived within 10 minutes before the brain gets permanently damaged, it gets back to work as if nothing had happened. What is that invisible line we seem to be crossing here? Dead one moment, alive the next. Whatever it is that occurs at death, it deserves to be called a miracle. Yet, could the actual miracle be that we don't die? Death is a huge taboo in our Western world. Death doesn't exist in the Western world. Uh, in medical study, we don't talk about death. And the death of the body is still taboo because most people, and especially most scientists, believe that the death of the body is the end of who you are, is the end of your consciousness. This complexity of the mystery of death in the Western civilization is very definingly recorded by the 17th century German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer in his book Parega and Paralipomena II. He writes, Were an Asiatic to ask me for a definition of Europe, I should be forced to answer him, it is that part of the world which is haunted by the incredible delusion that man was created out of nothing and that his present birth is his first entrance into life. Reincarnation, the idea that we return in another body after the death of our current body, has fascinated people throughout history. Wisdom traditions all over the globe have considered reincarnation as an integral tenet of their world views. Even pharaonic Egypt, polytheistic Greece and Rome, Taoism, Zoroastrianism, almost all ethnic shamanism and tribal beliefs across the globe accepted reincarnation. Considering the overwhelming global acceptance of reincarnation, it is no wonder that Schopenhauer considered the European disbelief in reincarnation an incredible delusion. The global expansion of European colonialism led to disbelief in reincarnation in the West and in the westernized parts of the East. Still, even today, one third of the world population believes in reincarnation. According to a survey conducted by the Pew Research Forum, nearly 24% of Americans believe in reincarnation. Similar statistics have been found for European countries. Perhaps times seem to be changing since Schopenhauer's wry observation. What may have caused this change? The recent findings in the fields of neuroscience. The mainstream view in neuroscience, in contemporary neuroscience, is that uh, what we call mind and consciousness are simply uh, the product of electrical and chemical activity in the brain. So that's, that's the central dogma. Uh, but there's a growing uh, number of scientists uh, arguing against uh, this view, based on a variety of uh, empirical evidence. Consciousness studies. Science is an evolving system, so our definition of material is changing and has changed. Our, our definition of living systems is changing as well. So at some point, the, the difference that we currently see between spiritual ideas, mystical ideas, and the physicalism that science is so good at, that, that will probably change.
So the, the interesting question is, will they begin to converge or diverge? Near-death experiences. All of us people investigating near-death experiences see the same pattern of elements. Often one of the first things to happen at that, right after that life-threatening event, often the first element of a near-death experience is what's called an out-of-body experience. Consciousness separates from the body and goes over the body. From that vantage point, they can see ongoing earthly events, which may include their own frantic resuscitation efforts. Past life memories research. These cases, you know, Ian called them cases of the reincarnation type. They do provide evidence that something has survived after somebody dies, that, that memories and emotions have survived. And quantum physics. Quantum physics finds that the answer to all of this riddle is really this idea that consciousness is the ground of all being. And matter exists as possibilities of this consciousness to choose from. Have all collectively forced our current science to reconsider many of the earlier held notions of mind, brain, body and consciousness. <laughs> So what are the latest theories in consciousness studies? And what do they tell us about the possibility of life after death? What exactly is consciousness? Consciousness refers to our awareness of things. Things are the objects of consciousness. But who is the subject of consciousness? Who is the I that is aware? This is a very good question. What is consciousness? And you know, um, I often give workshops on quantum consciousness, and so this is the question that I ask with, I start with. What is consciousness? What I expect is for most people to immediately come up with the answer, well, the very fact that I experience myself as I, that's consciousness, that's the basic thing, subjective experience. We have the experience of a self, of a subject. But you know what? In my vast experience of lecturer and workshop giver, I seldom get that answer from anyone in the audience. People have just lost their um, uh, import of the fact that they are conscious. They take it so much for granted that they think consciousness must be an object. A definition of consciousness that is uh, widely accepted in neuroscience and also is, is in psychology is uh, awareness of internal processes, that is, uh, your thoughts, feelings, uh, perceptions, and so on and so forth. And also awareness of the, uh, what we call the external world, the physical world, outside of the body. One of the ways of thinking about consciousness is the act of being self-aware. So it's awareness, and in particular self-awareness. That's consciousness. It's a challenge for science to discuss consciousness. Because our current science is reductionist and materialist, which means that we have to measure, to objectify, and to reproduce. We cannot do it with consciousness. You cannot prove consciousness. You cannot reproduce consciousness. You cannot objectify it. What we can measure in the brain with our imaging techniques is activities. We can measure changing activities in brain, chemical activities, electrical activities changes in blood flow, the fMRI, the PET scanners, chemical activities. But we cannot measure the content of our feelings and thoughts. We cannot measure the content of consciousness. The phenomenon of consciousness eludes precise scientific definition. Traditional theories propose that the brain produces consciousness. For decades indeed, we have believed that consciousness is a brain phenomenon. But before exploring the technicalities of this complex subject, it's important to reconsider our intuitive understanding of the word consciousness. With our intuitive understanding, we can perceive consciousness primarily as our sense of I-ness. I am. I exist. 
I am aware of my own existence. I am aware of the world around me, and so on. But who exactly is that I that is aware? Is the I the body, or is it something distinct from the body? From an intuitive point of view, our understanding suggests that the I is distinct from the body. When we see something beautiful, an image or a scene, or hear some melodious music, who is it that sees and hears? Is it the eye that sees? Is it the ear that hears? A body bereft of life has eyes and ears, but it does not see or hear. Why? Is it the brain or the entire nervous system that sees and hears then? But a body without life has a brain and nervous system too, yet it does not see or hear. Why? Whole model of scientific materialism is reductionism. Little objects like elementary particles make up atoms, make up molecules, make up neurons, make up the brain, and uh, then brain makes consciousness. This is the idea. But uh, look, objects can only make objects. Objects will never make subject. Object will never give you this phenomenon of the self that we experience. I, the experiencer. And you cannot say that you don't experience, you do experience. How do you experience? Or do, you, do you experience yourself as an object? No, it doesn't make any sense. You experience because you feel that you are separate from the objects that you experience. When we think and talk about our bodily parts, we say, my hand, my legs, and so on, not I hand or I legs. We think and talk of our body as my body, not I body, thus indicating that I am not my whole body either. This difference between me on one hand and my body and its parts on the other hand is not just a matter of quibbling with words, but is also a matter of practical experience. We feel ourselves as the possessor of our body and its parts. Could the answer be that something or someone distinct from the body does the perceiving? The question then still remains. Who is the I that claims owner's rights over the body and its parts? Could that elusive I who owns the body and its parts be another entity entirely? The soul as some wisdom traditions suggest. From a scientific perspective, science can say nothing about the soul, because for one thing, soul is not usually clearly defined. So we don't know what that is. If, if soul is thought of as something which is the essence of you, and is somehow conscious, well, then science can say a little bit, because we, we would say this has something to do with the brain. But that's usually not what the, the word is intended to mean. So, again, from a science perspective, we, we, don't, we have nothing to say. I mean, if we we're able to measure or observe something, then, then you could say something, but otherwise we can't. So it becomes a metaphysical question. From a metaphysical perspective, uh, perhaps there's some independent entity that, that comes into the body and then gives it awareness or life. When a loved one dies, the everyday language of their relatives resonates with this traditional wisdom, even if they themselves aren't aware of this resonance. They say, he has passed away. But who or what has passed away? The person that they think they loved is still lying there. The body has not gone anywhere. Yet they feel an acute sense of bereavement. Their feelings of loss affirm their words. The actual person they loved has indeed passed away. So the question still remains, who has passed away? Could it be something different from the body, whose presence made the body appear alive, and whose departure made the body dead? Who is that unchanging person? If we evaluate the chemicals that comprise the body, they cost a few dollars. Yet we all know that we are something more, much more. Who is that I? People used to measure 
a person's weight just before the person died and just after the person died, and they never found any difference in weight. Just before and after the moment of death, the chemical composition of the body remains the same. Yet something essential has changed. Life has left the body. If the chemicals that comprise our body don't tally with our sense of identity and personality, or our sense of self-worth, or our sense of the transition at death, then could we be missing the point by identifying ourselves as the bag of chemicals that is our body? Today, advanced computers can do many of the things that once only human beings could do. Like playing chess, for example. Does the ability of computers to do such human activities demonstrate that there is no essential difference between machines and human beings? Are we humans nothing more than machines? What defines us as human beings is this capacity to have subjective experiences associated to a variety of things. Could be objects uh, outside of the, uh, the physical body. Could be a tree in a forest, for instance or beautiful sunsets, sundown, etc. Uh, it's also the subjective experience that is associated with cognitive processes, with thoughts, creativity, and so on and so forth. And of course, associated also with um, emotions and uh, spiritual experiences. The mystical experiences across cultures, across history, tend to be about the same. That says that what we're dealing with is a, is a basic human experience. There's something happening that many, many people report, not only in ancient times, but today still, that we really don't understand at all from a scientific perspective, but it suggests that there's something real going on and probably very important because it tells us something about who we actually are and what the nature of subjectivity is all about. Perhaps the answer lies in analyzing a landmark event in the development of computers. In 1997, the chess-playing computer Deep Blue created a global sensation by defeating the reigning world chess champion Garry Kasparov. After the match, Kasparov was disappointed. The leader of the team that had designed Deep Blue was delighted. But Deep Blue, which had actually won the match, was not delighted. In fact, it had no emotions at all. It had simply done number processing in accordance with its advanced program which, in turn, had borrowed and pulled together the chess-playing expertise of several chess masters. Deep Blue, by functioning according to its program, had played chess and won the match without experiencing any of the essential emotions that a chess player goes through. Well, yes, the, the, the machine, the, the, the supercomputers, or the, even the computers involved in those famous chess matches, uh, they are totally devoid of subjective experiences. So they don't have any emotional feelings, uh, but they don't have also any uh, spiritual experiences. And they, uh, they are very far from what are human beings, uh, basically. Deep Blue's victory shows that even when computers have number processing capabilities that exceed those of humans, they still can't experience any emotions at all. These are problems which on one hand suggest that maybe there is no mind, there is only brain. That's the position of the scientific materialist. But that fails because it turns out that brain has to be a computer-like thing that people can agree upon. But computers cannot process meaning, as Roger Penrose has shown, mathematically. So what is the way out? So mind must be separate, non-material, something that not the brain, not a computer. Computers cannot process because mind can't process meaning. In fact, mind is the meaning giver. So maybe we should be asking, what is the source of consciousness? The source of consciousness? Well, this is a, a big question that is beyond uh, science, of course, because this it's the kind of question that we cannot address from a scientific point of view, but as scientists and as human beings, of course, we have our own beliefs, opinions about this fundamental uh, question. The source of consciousness is a very troublesome question anyway. Because we are scientific materialists, we, of course, ask the question because 
consciousness must be a material phenomenon and then of course the answer comes since brain is always involved whenever we have a conscious experience so brain must be the source of consciousness that scientific material is talking but then all these problems brain cannot explain how it interacts with the mind brain cannot interact with the mind in any kind of way that we know uh, how does brain have consciousness as a problem, a huge problem, because how then can brain be experienced as a subject? Objects only give object, consciousness is not an object, so that is the problem. Why does science not have an answer to this basic, fundamental question? The materialist theory proposes that the brain produces consciousness. But there are three main problems with this theory. First, how can unconscious brain cells produce consciousness? Second, how can our memories stay intact despite the constant change of brain cells? Third, how can consciousness change the brain's structure? Let's consider the first question. How can unconscious brain cells produce consciousness? This problem has perplexed modern science since the 17th century, when the materialist approach started gaining prominence. Two centuries later, consciousness still remained a problem, as English biologist T. H. Huxley noted. How it is that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as the result of irritating nervous tissue is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the djinn when Aladdin rubbed his lamp. 140 years later, the problem still remained intractable, as reported in the reputed scientific journal Science, in its special 125th anniversary issue, published in 2005. This issue featured 125 questions that scientists had been unable to answer. The second most important unanswered question, after the question, what is the universe made of, was, what is the biological basis of consciousness? The question was, what is the biological basis of consciousness? And I changed the question into, is there a biological basis of consciousness at all? Because I don't believe there's a biological basis of consciousness. In this special issue, science writer Greg Miller phrased the problem to be, how a particular pattern of photons hitting the retina produces the experience of seeing, say, a rose. As you watch these light rays striking the magnified eye, similar tiny beams of light are entering your own eyes. When we see a rose, light rays of various frequencies enter the retina of our eye. The eye cells react to the amount of light entering and then generate electrochemical impulses that pass through the optic nerve to the visual areas of the brain. This activates certain nerve cells and their connections with other cells. What then? How does the image of a rose emerge in our consciousness? Where is that image formed in the brain? Nobel laureate Francis Crick admits, so far we can locate no single region in which the neural activity corresponds exactly to the vivid picture of the world we see in front of our eyes. Even if neuroscientists succeed in finding the precise neural activity that corresponds to the image of the rose, a bigger question would still remain. Where does the experience of seeing and feeling take place? Who is it that sees the rose and feels it to be beautiful? Moving on to the second question, how can our memory stay intact despite the constant change of brain cells. The, the, this question of where is uh, memory in the brain uh, has been addressed for decades and decades in neuroscience. And it started in the 20s with a famous professor called Carl Lashley. Uh, and Lashley was trying to identify the, the regions of the brain that were involved in the um, creation of the memories, consolidation, and also the uh, arc, the, the stocking of the, the memories. So he, he made lesions in various portions of the brain. Uh, he was using rodents mainly. And um, 
he was removing parts after parts, but still the animals were, you know, keeping uh, learning. And so he concluded that the memories uh, could not be found in, in association with a specific region in the brain. We don't know where memory is stored. It's again, it's, it's like asking about consciousness. There are lots of the true answer is now for most of the really interesting questions that we have, we don't know. That's why there, there are still interesting questions. If memory uh, partially stored in the brain, probably. Is some aspect of consciousness probably in the brain somehow? Probably. Uh, the question in, in all cases, though, is, the, is that all there is? Is that a, a fully comprehensive answer? And I think the answer is not. That there's, there's some aspect of memory, there's some aspect of consciousness, probably cognition. All of that, largely in there, but it's not all in there. It, or our sense of where there is, is not completely correct. Still, the belief continued that somehow memories are stored in the brain. And as our memories are stable, it was assumed that the brain cells that held those memories also needed to be stable. So it was long believed that once animals or humans reach adulthood, they can no longer grow new brain cells. Each second, 500,000 cells die in your body. Each day, 50 billion cells die in your body are being replaced. About each year you have a new body. It's changed continuously. But you're still feeling the same. But when you look at the picture when you're younger now, the essence of who you are is still the same. If cells are constantly dying and new ones are being produced, how could that be possible? Imagine you wrote a message on a piece of paper. Suppose we then replaced all the molecules of that paper and found that the resulting paper still had the same message written on it. Wouldn't that be amazing? This example highlights the universal problem that any mechanism would face. As consciousness researcher Dean Radin points out, all of the material used to express that pattern of information has disappeared and yet the pattern still exists. What holds the pattern, if not matter? This question is not easily answered by the assumptions of a mechanistic, purely materialistic science. Is it possible that our memories are stored not just in the brain, but also in some non-material storehouse from where they are made available to the newly formed brain cells? Does this imply that our consciousness has its origin somewhere beyond the brain? Of course, it is true that damage to the brain usually impairs the corresponding bodily functions. Damage to the speech center of the brain, for example, often results in an inability to speak. But do such instances prove that the brain is the source of consciousness? Well, the question about source of consciousness usually refers back to the brain. Because if you start scooping out bits of the brain, then people don't have consciousness anymore, so it's easy to make an inference that it's somehow created by the object in there. And that may be the case. But of course, the, the alternative is that consciousness is somehow out there, and the brain is a particularly suited device or, or system that evolution has evolved in order to be able to re receive it, or to reflect it, or to somehow be influenced by it. And the neuroscientists today don't actually have a good answer to that question because when we take measurements from the brain, what we see are correlations. The correlations are pretty good. Your conscious awareness and thoughts and cognition and so on is correlated with brain stuff, but it doesn't necessarily point at the arrow of causation. The brain and consciousness are intimately connected, but neuroscientists have trouble specifying the nature of that connection. The renowned psychologist William James claimed that the correspondence between brain damage and bodily function could also be explained if the brain were merely transmitting and not producing consciousness. He illustrated this with the example of the way a prism transmits light. When a prism is damaged, the light passed through it may get distorted. Similarly, when the brain gets damaged, the consciousness passed through it may get impeded. The brain is a receiver of consciousness and it is manipulated by what consciousness wants it to do. So it's a two-way street. If you damage the brain, your awareness of the world is quite different because consciousness will not operate through it in, in the usual way. If you modify, for instance, 
something, a component, an electronic component within your TV set, of course you will alter the reception of the information, for instance, the images, the sound, and so on and so forth, but that does not affect at all the program itself or the, the TV station that is sending the electromagnetic waves to the air, you see? So it's a bit the, this, the, the same kind of analogy that we can use with regard to the relationship between what we call mind and brain. I would say that ev so far every experience that people have is correlated with brain activity. That doesn't mean that the brain is causing it. It may be that the brain is reflecting what's going on. So the causal direction on experience we don't understand very well. This idea of an extracerebral source of consciousness gains support from another astonishing finding. The ability of some people to do normal conscious activities despite having little or no brain. In the 1980s, British neurologist Dr. John Lorber published his groundbreaking study relating to hydranencephaly, where the subjects experienced normal consciousness while having little or no brain matter. Very interesting examples of uh, hydra and encephaly, uh, where the, the cerebral hemispheres, the cortex, is not there, it's absent. And the, uh, the hemispheres are replaced by sacs filled with what we call cerebrospinal fluid. And in such cases, according to mainstream neuroscience, um, the people suffering from this form of disorder should not be intelligent at all, should not be able to function cognitively. Yet there's a neurologist uh, called John Lorber at the University of Sheffield in the UK. Uh, during the 70s and the 80s, he scanned hundreds of those patients, and many of those patients were intellectually very strong. Uh, in one of the cases, um, one of the patients had an IQ of 126, he received a PhD in uh, mathematics. A contemporary practice reinforcing Lorber's findings is the surgical procedure hemispherectomy. This rare form of surgery, where half the brain is removed, has been performed hundreds of times over the last century to treat disorders uncontrollable in any other way. Unbelievably, the surgery has no apparent effect on personality or memory. If memories are stored in the brain, how could removing half the brain leave the memories unaffected? Hemispherectomy is the um, ablation uh, or the non-appearance of one hemisphere of the brain, which is one half of the brain, which contains the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex is involved, is associated with all sorts of cognitive and emotional functions. So if, for example, during uh, childhood, uh, a child has one of his cerebral hemispheres removed, the other half of the brain will take charge and there will be a total reorganization of the uh, neural connections in the brain and also the nerve cells, and the, the child will be able to function uh, very often normally uh, from an intellectual point of view. There's always changes in, con in, in, in brain function, always. There's written down a case in my book of a girl of three years old who had one top part of the brain was taken out because of intreatable epilepsy. And within one year, she could speak two languages, could play, could talk, could everything. So the one hemisphere took over the function of the two. And under the age of four, the brain is extremely plastic. For a long time, surgeons have been removing small diseased parts of the brain without causing any significant impairment of memory. The materialist explanation for this post-surgical continuity of memory is that there may be redundancy in the storage capacity of the brain. That is, the same memories may be stored in multiple places. So the theory goes, even if some part of the brain is lost, 
the memories can be retrieved from its other storage locations. However, the idea that a full 50% of the brain is redundant, as hemispherectomy would imply, stretches credulity. And some of the subjects reported by Lorber had normal memories, despite having less than 5% of the normal brain substance. To account for this, material neuroscientists would have to claim that 95% of the brain is redundant. Now the third question. How can consciousness change the brain structure? Many scientific studies have demonstrated that our mental activities cause changes in the structure of our brain. This phenomenon is called neuroplasticity. The power of positive thoughts to improve one's sense of well-being and health has long been well known, but until recently, the power of one's thoughts to change the physical structure of the brain had been entirely unknown. There's uh, increasing evidence showing that uh, you can change the adult brain if you do, for instance, certain types of uh, mental uh, exercise. We can take the case of meditation. We now know that if you meditate for even only a few months, you will change the way the uh, regions that are associated to attention, concentration um, uh, in the brain, the way they are uh, functioning. But you can also, uh, if you pursue your meditation training, after a few more weeks or even uh, months, there will be structural changes in those regions, which means that there will be an increase, for instance, in terms of uh, the gray matter, so the, the neurons themselves, and the white matter, which is the, uh, you know, the axons, the connecting uh, the neurons between themselves. So it's now possible to transform functionally and structurally your brain after only a few months of training. And this has been shown in recent years uh, using brain imaging uh, tools like uh, functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging scanners. Well, now that we know, and this is fairly recently known, that, that what you think about in your head and what you focus on will change brain structure. The morphology changes, the connections in the brain change, and they change quickly. That suggests that if you take somebody who is a very long-term disciplined meditator, their brain is probably very different. And there's some evidence of that as well. In terms of gamma frequencies and so on, there's, there's different structure that's going on. Materialist science holds that consciousness can have no effect on the brain as it is produced by the brain. But the phenomenon of neuroplasticity demonstrates that consciousness does indeed change the brain structure. Dr. Pim van Lommel explains the implications of this as it would be incorrect to claim that consciousness can only be a product of brain function. How could a product be able to change its own producer? This idea that consciousness has an existence independent of the brain is also substantiated by the experiments of Nobel laureate Dr. Wilder Penfield. During my life as a brain surgeon, it has been necessary to operate on a good many men and women, a good many hundreds, and to expose the brain under local anesthesia with the co patient conscious. Dr. Penfield conducted many experiments to investigate the relationship between simple physical activities like raising or lowering the arm on one hand and the corresponding activities that happened in the brain on the other hand. In the first case, Dr. Penfield observed that when a subject was told to raise his arm, a specific part of the cerebral cortex was activated. And when the subject was told to bring his arm down, that part of the brain was deactivated. Then, in the second case, Dr. Penfield observed that when he used electrodes to artificially activate that specific part of the brain, the subject's arm rose up automatically. When Dr. Penfield asked the subject, did you raise your arm? The subject replied with full certainty, I didn't raise my arm, it rose up by itself. Then Dr. Penfield deactivated that part of the brain and the arm went down. The subject, on inquiry, described, my arm fell down, I did not bring it down. Let's consider the implications of this simple experiment. In both cases, 
The activation of the brain led to the raising of the arm, and its deactivation led to the lowering of the arm. But who or what caused the activation and deactivation of the brain? In the second case, it was Dr. Penfield, an external agent who physically stimulated the brain to activate it. Who was the agent activating it in the first case, when the subject raised his arm voluntarily? A question worth pondering over. After pondering for over four long decades on the implications of his research, Dr. Penfield concluded, the brain is a computer, but it is programmed by something that is outside itself. Consciousness and our experience of the self are deeply intertwined. Normally, we derive our sense of self from our body, our appearance, our family, our history, our nationality, or our roles as a father, mother, lover, our jobs, our social and financial status, or other people's opinions of us. We also derive our identity from our thoughts and feelings, our belief system, our values, our creative and intellectual capacities, our character, and what we call our personality. All this, and much more, determines our sense of who we are. Without consciousness, there is no perception, no thoughts, no feelings, no knowledge, and no memory. But who are we, in essence, independent of our thoughts, feelings, ideas, and memories? Eminent neuroscientists, including Nobel laureates John Eccles, Wilda Penfield, and Charles Sherrington, feel that a complete explanation of consciousness requires the inclusion of a non-material paradigm. Materialism is one of the uh, basic philosophical assumptions of what we call modern science, which has appeared about four centuries ago. Uh, you had also other assumptions like reductionism, which is the idea that you can reduce uh, all sorts of complex phenomena, uh, like, for instance, mind consciousness, to simpler phenomena. Well, that is the activity, for instance, of uh, material particles uh, in the brain and also material fields. Uh, and so these assumptions represent the, uh, the basis, the foundation of modern science. But a uh, hundred years ago, there was a revolution in physics. And um, quantum physics showed that the materialist assumption about the world is totally flawed, it's erroneous. The current materialist, reductionist paradigm is inadequate to comprehend this non-measurable, non-verifiable, and hence essentially non-physical phenomenon. We have to change science to study consciousness, and which means that we have to include subjective experiences into science. But that means that science has to change from objective, materialistic science into an all-inclusive science. We have to include everything, we have to ask questions about everything, also subjective experiences. So we have to basically change science as well. And also our worldview will change, and our ideas about life and death will change. The non-material paradigm suggests that consciousness is non-material, non-local, and endless. Consciousness is not confined to the brain and that the brain facilitates rather than produces our experience of consciousness. In view of the findings from NDE cases, past life memory studies, and brain consciousness relationship, we ought to seriously consider the possibility that death, like birth, may be a mere passing from one state of consciousness into another. In attempting to understand this, we should keep in mind that some physicists now consider consciousness to be an entity separate from the brain and one with important functions in the universe. This entity that we may call the soul does not cease to exist at death and does not come into existence at birth. It has always existed in the past and will continue to exist in the future. Now. As death inches towards losing its finality, 
and eternity comes into life's grasp. What remains to be explored is the mechanism that drives it, the where and how of reincarnation. Our science today may not be able to give clear-cut answers to these questions, but are we totally without any answers? The wisdom traditions have a lot to say about interiority, about sub the subjective world. Science is really good about the objective world. In order to know the comprehensive world, we need to combine both of those in, in some meaningful way. What about our history? The past glorious civilizations? The great ancient wisdom traditions and philosophies? Do they offer any insights? Join us next time as we dive even deeper into unraveling the mystery of life, death and reincarnation.